and welcome to Caged In, the podcast where we watch every single Nicolas Cage film to determine if he is the greatest actor of all time. I have the absolute pleasure of presenting to you today an extra special Caged In conversation. I had the absolute pleasure of talking to Tom Gormican and Kevin Etten, the co-writers, and Tom Gormican is the director of the brand new Nicolas Cage film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, that I'm sure if you're not aware of uh, by now, is released today, day of release of this episode. So uh, get out to cinemas and see it. It's so heartening to see the amount of like push this film is getting. It's the strewn across buses. Seems to be, I'm not sure if it's just my algorithm, but every time I got an IMDb kind of, it's the the online kind of adverts everywhere, and it's it's. I got to tell you, as a Nicolas Cage fan, this is like the like Avengers Endgame for me, and I'm sure I'm sure all you Nickheads listening to this probably feel the same. It's kind of I don't know. As soon as I heard about this project, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like I know the script has kind of been knocking about for a few years, and then when Cage signed on to do it, it's like. Here we go. Cage playing himself kind of in a once every 20 years being involved in a massive meta movie. Obviously, 20 years ago this year uh, would have seen the release of Adaptation. And now we get the unbearable weight of massive talent, a film I've seen not once but twice at the time of recording this. Uh, So, yeah, I had the absolute pleasure of being invited to a press screening my first press screening on this podcast it was an absolute kind of otherworldly experience i kind of didn't know what to do with myself as i'll be honest with you guys up front that like even getting to the screen even though like i don't know i feel like i've put in the work on this podcast like i've kind of spoke to some amazing people i put together the pick cast which i think is a kind of like i don't know there's no, normally people get paid by the studios to do something like that but I did it off my own back just because I love this. And uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about these films and these people. So being able to get to that press screening, like, right up until like, I, was, I was going in, I was like, ah, duh. The, the, the imposter syndrome kicked in and the, the, I kind of fumbled at the desk like with my name. I was like, oh, it's a bit of a like, uh, pardon? I was like, ah, oh, that's it. Some, some burly man is going to grab me and sling me out the door. But uh, alas, um, no, the person on the desk was like, oh, Petros, it's so great to see you. Head on through to the screening. Help yourself at the free bar, which for me, a working class kid kind of uh, being told there's a free bar. My eyes lit up. I was kind of excitement was already at fever pitch. So imagine being told there's a free bar as well. And uh, yeah, I got got a free bag of crisps got like a kind of Nicolas Cage paddle with his face on it and then a little uh yeah a little QR code that takes you to the trailer the unbearable way massive talent branding yeah got to sit down watch the film and then following Monday got to speak said to uh Tom and Kevin got 20 minutes of their time and I think we get into some interesting stuff in this so it's, it's fairly spoiler light but uh maybe hold off until you've seen the film maybe don't like kind of uh you might be able to tell in my question like whether it's going to kind of tiptoe into spoiler area so just hit that kind of skip 30 seconds and you'll kind of uh, avoid anything but i don't i don't think we really get into if anything we kind of spoil something that's not even in the movie we get to talk about a, a kind of already mythic deleted scene so yeah that's something to look forward to so enjoy my conversation with tom gormican and kevin etten i have the absolute pleasure of being joined today on the podcast by the minds behind the unbearable weight of massive talent tom gomkin and kevin etten how are you gentlemen fantastic fantastic thanks for having us yeah thank you thanks for having us how are you oh I, i'm fantastic and i just want to say thank you both for making one of the funniest films i've seen in years and one that will surely give me hours upon hours of content for this here podcast uh <laughs> I, I guess i need to start with the basics here and uh ask you 
Where did this idea come from, and why Nicolas Cage? I mean, why not Nicolas Cage? <laughs> you know, I think that the, the seed of the idea was just like, there's something about Nicolas Cage that has transcended being an actor. You know, he's not just an actor. He's like a cultural icon. He's like an institution that you come back to when you need to smile. Like it, like the memification and like internet embrace of Nicolas Cage is something that like, just thinking about like, I, why do why does everyone love him? Why do, why do we love him? And putting him in a narrative about himself was just sort of the germ of the idea. And then <clears throat> Kevin and I got together and just were like, okay, we're very interested in this. Let's craft the narrative around it where he's invited to a super fan's birthday party. And that was the jumping off point. And what was the like pl was there a plan if nick said no to this project where were, were there were, was it was it just we'll shelf it and that, that's it we we didn't really have a plan i think there <laughs> were certain certain points in the process where you know because i i really wanted to sell the script that i maybe tried to convince tom that there were other actors that would <laughs> flip it yeah, yeah. Uh, the plan was kevin loses his house yeah <laughs> we've spent a year <laughs> not having a job writing a movie about an actor uh, the uh, only yeah. the only fun idea that i think one of our friends had was that if nick wouldn't do it that we should try to get like christian bale or daniel day lewis to wear nick cage prosthetics and play nick cage so like christian bale at the <laughs> was the, the backup <laughs> plan i guess yeah and nick cage's <laughs> prosthetics and you know you want to see bale's cage it would be fantastic yeah. yep. i could see uh daniel day lewis very much in new orleans in like a european castle really living the life of Nicolas Cage for like a year, <laughs> yeah, right? two years to get into the room. Uh, yeah, spending a few months down there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah. Trying to source a two-headed snake from somewhere, anything, <laughs> anything wild that he can he can come across. Um, ah, that is kind of a movie I would... <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> we should have... <laughs> We should. That's the sequel. That it's the Daniel sequel Day game. Lewis preparing yes. to play Nicolas Cage. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the that's the meta upon meta aspect uh -huh. of the <clears throat> film. Made a trend that every twenty years in Nicolas Cage's career, he seems to be in a meta film, whether it's adaptation twenty years ago this year, and obviously your film. Like, I can only imagine what. 20 years time will be whether he's playing somebody else in a kind of meta film uh but yeah in 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 that regard like what was that first meeting with nick cage like when you kind of floated this idea to him about playing himself well we had been through the roller coaster already because we wrote the entire script so we had that and to, to to give him and he was not sure that he wanted to do it and then kevin and i had written him a letter detailing why we thought it was a great idea to do it and you know eventually you know he said it's a big performance art piece where you get to play with people's idea about who you are and who you really are and he kind of got into that and then finally he agreed to have lunch with us which was our initial goal on the film. We were yeah. like, if we write this, it's the movie that we want to see. And if Nick, Nick Cage agrees to have like a salad in Los Angeles with <laughs> us, that would, it would really make us, it just would, it, it would make it worth it. So we get there and you have to understand like for about a year and I don't know, a year and six months or, you know, at, at this point, um, all we've been thinking about is Nicolas Cage. So it was really, and we get there and I said, we've been thinking about you for so long that this is like the most surreal moment. And he was like, uh, it, it, it is very surreal for me too. And we were like, <laughs> just sat down. He's like, we're all kind of weirded out at the beginning. And we just said, hey, look, we're, we're massive fans of yours. And we want this to be like a reverential celebration of your catalog. And he sort of eased into you know being friends and collaborators with us so obviously yeah nick in interviews has referred to you guys as the mind do you mind explaining what that nickname means at all i think that it started out you know sort of like he would see the two of us you know after takes talking and discussing and then tom would come over and he would go <laughs> okay here comes the mind you know like yeah and so it, it was a way to kind of you know it, at first i think it was a little like a little a little dig but it was a loving sort of 
Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that you guys are taking this as seriously as I am because, you know, Nick, I will say that he, his mind is, you know, so fast and so he's so knowledgeable about film and he has such a clear idea of like what he wants to do um, in, in, in these roles. And with us, he would always, we would find, Tom would get the text, but it would be, you know, coming at 4.30 in the morning the day before we were shooting, all his notes, all his ideas, all his thoughts from his mind of what he wanted to accomplish. And so it was a melding of minds uh, <laughs> during the day. Yeah, and you know, you have to understand Cage would, um, or the cage uh, would, <laughs> would, would get on his elliptical machine every morning from like three to 4.30 and he would reread the script and he'd have all these thoughts about it. And so Cage, despite his protesting this idea, he is an overthinker, you know, and, and he over, he's thinking about the role constantly. We'd constantly be thinking about it as a result of his texts he would send after rereading the script. And then we would all sort of get together. So when he saw us approaching, he would be like, oh God, here comes the mind, here comes the mind. They've got something in store for me. And oftentimes it was like, because he has so many things to do in the movie, he would be like, just don't tell me it's more dialogue, please. <laughs> yeah. like... well, well, I've had the I've had the pleasure on this podcast to talk to so many people who've worked with Nick, and one of the things that's always brought up to me is like how he just knows the script back to front, and he's always coming up with ideas. Whether it's uh, Brian Taylor with Mum and Dad, he wanted to let's do the hokey cokey as i destroy this pool table or yeah, yeah. color out of space it was an idea that was kibosh but it's like maybe my character wears a peg on his nose like what were the kind of uh <laughs> ideas that nick came to you guys with and what what kind of uh like saw it to the screen like yeah what were some of those kind of ideas he floated to you guys the best one was uh you know the there's a scene where Nick and young Nick are in a bar having a drink. And the way we had scripted it was young Nick would kiss Nick on the cheek. And Nick came uh -huh. to us that morning and said, you know, I think it should be like a very deep French kiss. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were, of course, just like, yes, please. This is, I, we could never, you know, we best never would possible have idea. Yeah, exactly. We would actually be terrified to pitch that to Nick. You've got a French kiss yourself. <laughs> You know, so he would come up with those things all the time. He came, and he came up with the the line right after that, like you tell him, uh, you tell him Nick Cage, Nick, Nick Cage is, good. is good was his was his uh, line that he wanted to, which is great. In the screening I was in, that got uh, like rupturous, like laughter and applause. <laughs> like everyone, lo everyone loved that moment. Um, so, in regard to the character of Nicky, shall we call him the the younger Nick Cage? Like, what was it about? about that kind of high kicking money throwing terry wogan era like that 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 yeah that that performance and that kind of appearance that cage gave that made that the sticking point given this there's so many cages to pick from yeah i mean well the movie was just it, like a long exercise in finding the best cage you know <laughs> and so part of that <laughs> You know, Nick, for Nikki, there was technical considerations like directorial ideas where like how far could we actually de-age him with it still mm -hmm. looking acceptable. So there's some technical things within, you know, within our budget, um, because the, 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 the further you go, the more sort of artistry you need, the more time it takes and it expands the <clears throat> the cost. And so there was that. But then it was like, OK, what's the best version? It can't be a character that he's played in a movie because that's mm -hmm. not him. It has to be a version of Nick. And Nick brought the Wogan interview to our attention and he said, I just look at this guy and I find him so obnoxious <laughs> that like, I want the opportunity to go back into his skin and make him the villain in the film. And of course, you know, it's one of those things we were like, okay, that sounds fantastic. We love the hair. We love the differentiation. And we loved that type of character, that brash, like over the top kind of thing where Nick channel his expressionistic ideas about performance into. And I, you know, of course, we had no idea how it was going to work, and we thought it came out, you know, pretty cagey. I mean, yeah, that was the only the only person who really could know that answer was Nick, right? Because uh -huh. it's like he was like, yeah. when I was this age, I was this guy. I was a, an yeah. asshole in the way this guy's an asshole. You know, <laughs> when I was face off in Con Air, I was a different guy. I had a family, like I was way more grounded. So he 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 had the answer, yeah. 
so yeah like what one of the things i wanted to to, to delve into and you saying about like the surrealist aspect of like nikki and stuff like that is uh, cage has gone on record saying that you gave him an ultimatum in regards to a scene that like kind of already is gaining traction in regards to the kind of cabinet of D dr caligari stuff that was cut from the film and he said that you said or i'm not sure if it's you or the studio kind of said that it was it was the the young nikki stuff or if it was the the kind of cabinet of D dr caligari stuff what 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 were those scenes like to, to to create and what what were they well there was a there was a sort of culmination of the nick nicky relationship where he has to dispatch this kind of <laughs> this voice that's that in his head telling him that he should be someone else in order to grow as both like a father and an actor and an ex-husband and kind of become a better version of himself and so we were going to dramatize it as like an action sequence through mm -hmm. his old movies. And we thought, you know, it's part of the reason we were seating the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, because uh, we wanted to see it play out in that German expressionist style in black and white. And we created all these incredibly angular, cool sets with Kevin Kavanaugh, our production designer, you know, who's Nathan Crowley's art director. He's like, he's brilliant. And we created the GT500 Mustang that he drives and gone in 60 seconds and the Ducati and they're chasing each other. And we're using these, these um, zoetropes, you know, these spinning zoetropes with 20,000 watt bulbs in them, three of them to make it look like those things are actually moving because it's all on stage, playing the perspective and, you know, built the Leaving Las Vegas hotel room where he ends up killing Nikki. And it's, it, it was, it, you know, I think it was just a bridge <laughs> too far for the studio <laughs> after making a film that, uh, you know, like it, it, take a, it took a lot of balls for Lionsgate to commit to this project in the first place. <laughs> we commend and applaud them for it because it's a deeply weird studio film. Uh, and I think that was just like, and it's also in black and white and they're going, okay, enough guys. We have to draw the line somewhere. We're doing a commercial movie. And so it ended up, you know, being cut from the film. So on that kind of uh, like tangent of like uh, the tonality of the film, I found myself watching it in the screening, like one moment I'd be like side splittingly laughing and then it was quite poignant and melancholic. How important was it for you to kind of get that balance of tone right in this film? Yeah, I think that was kind of the, the whole thing, like, and that was the hardest um the hardest challenge through the whole process from the script and wanting the script to feel like we had a real character that you could go on a journey with and that you could move through genres but find some kind of semblance of a a through line for him and it was something that we challenged us at every phase you know when we we tested the movie with audiences a few times to to see the you know the scenes that were too comic and that mm -hmm. the scenes that felt too uh, sentimental and so it was and then in with our music that was another one where you go mm -hmm. if, it, if, if the music plays too dramatic it sucks all the comedy out of it so that was by far the hardest and then also I will say that that was a challenge another challenge with the studio was was for them to kind of believe that an audience could sustain that jumping of genres um, yeah and Kevin and I talked about this a lot when we were writing the script we said look, this, if we don't make you emotionally attached to this character and move you in some way where you're willing to actually get behind this, Nic this version of Nicolas Cage, then it's a sketch. It's mm -hmm. not a film. It's a, it's, and it's a parody. And we didn't want that. We wanted some sincerity uh, involved in this thing because it is a celebration of his work. So, you know, that, that was the starting point where we said, okay, this, we're, we're going to, we're going to, ask the actors to take everything that they're doing seriously, let the script do the work and try to find like a backbone of this thing tonally that didn't stray too far. Mm -hmm. And we well, test well, the limits of it at times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Moments and like, you know. We said well, we, had a funny, we had a funny scene that we had to cut. I was talking about where after they drop acid, Nick mm -hmm. and Pedro end up in a church and Nick looks up and he sees Jesus and Jesus turns to him and says, I, you know, I'm so sorry to be this guy, but I absolutely loved you and, you know, bad lieutenant. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all New Orleans. All yeah. New Orleans. <laughs> and it was, it was funny, hey, but it was like, you Nick's know, it was going, just, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank yeah. you. I was very happy with how it came out, you know. <laughs> it was just, but it was too much ultimately for the film to kind of bear, but. 
a lot of fun stuff. It was a lot of trial and error, tonal trial and error. How, how was it finding that balance between, obviously you expect the film to kind of bring in a new audience that don't have, yeah, like me, who's kind of seen every single Nicolas Cage film. Like how was it kind of, <laughs> Finding that balance of getting stuff that was like enough to draw people in, but not being like too niche where it's like, this is just for the kind of like the SWATs, do you know what I mean? Like the, the, the Uber fans. Yeah. Well, yeah, we thought like there's a lot of references in the movie, both visual and, and, and verbal. And we thought like this movie should work even if you've never seen a Nicolas Cage movie. You should buy into a guy that doesn't feel like he's where he should be in his, his life and career and has some growing to do. And we dramatized the idea that there's a voice in his head holding him back and he needs to overcome it. And we thought there's like a universality to that very simple construction of a story. And we thought the best version of this movie works on its own. Uh -huh. And yeah, and uh, you know, just as a as as a narrative, and and that was like an important thing for us. Perfect. Well, um, yeah, I guess like one of the kind of central uh, relationships in this film, more so than a romantic relationship, is that bromance between um, Nick and ha Harvey. How how important was it for you guys to kind of get that chemistry right between those two characters and? obviously yeah seeing the film it's like oh you couldn't have had anyone better than pedro pascal how was how was it working with him and kind of seeing that chemistry live yeah i mean i think we yeah we really pedro was the key to making the film work obviously mm -hmm. we needed nick but then if that character doesn't work the film doesn't work and you know partly when when we were thinking about that that role we um you know we had the chance to have lunch with pedro and and he said to us right away, he's like, you know what, guys, I don't care if I don't get the film. Uh, obviously, I want it. But like, I just want to talk to you guys about Nick Cage because I'm a I'm a true fan. And he was so he is the absolute fanboy. So that when we were making that decision, it was it was hard because Pedro hasn't done big comedy movies. Right. Um, but ultimately, we just said, like, he's a really great actor and he is this guy and so he is going to act he's going to know how to act that fanboy role and so you know it, we took a little bit of a leap of faith in that way but it, it obviously worked out yeah and there was there was a when pedro finally got to set he came in we've seen him play like very macho like roles like a viper and narcos and you see him as this guy but when you meet pedro there's like this inherent kind of sweetness and softness to him and he's like a character and we thought oh this is the guy but so pedro came and he said i've got some ideas about how to play it and they were more sort of macho guy they were more of like the 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 the, the guy that the cia says he is right it says he's this like gangster character and so Pedro and I had a long talk at the beginning where I said, no, I want the guy who's more like Pedro. I want this like sweet super fan because Nick is going to play the gruff Charles Bronson version of Nicolas Cage, you know? And like that, that sort of that dynamic uh, made us both smile. And we were like, that's, that's the alchemy we're looking for. That's the, that's the type of like sort of winning chemistry we thought might work. Well, yeah, it's, he, he kind of really kind of encapsulates what it is to be a Nicolas Cage fan. And like, uh, I, I, I found myself kind of being like, he's a surrogate for all of us kind of Nick heads, as I, as I, as I call it. So, um, so yeah, exactly yeah. Right. it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Do you, do, would, would, would you ever take on another project like this? Is there, is there another actor in your crosshairs or is there another nick cage project you would like to do would you like to work with nick again i, I can imagine it would have been a lot of fun i would uh i would love to work with nick again i know we don't yeah. have any other you know actors <laughs> in this type of world but like i think it'd be so fun to work with them it, it, you know it, it's always nice to have someone there on your project that cares about it as much as you do and kevin and i care deeply about the work that we're doing and 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 nick was right there with us and that was really kind of i'd absolutely dive into that pool again absolutely yeah amazing well it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you guys hope you enjoy the rest of the junket and it's not too much uh hassle again yeah. thank you so much for your time Great talking to you as well thank, thank you, thank you. There we have it, guys. My conversation with the mind and the penultimate mind of the fantastic 
the unbearable weight of massive talent. If you've seen this film, please do get in touch. Uh, we're going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of coverage coming over the next month or so on this here podcast talking about it. Um, I know just just next week I'll be recording with three other UK based Nicolas Cage podcasts to kind of have the ultimate mega chat about this film and our top five Nicolas Cage films. So yeah, reach me on all the socials. That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterbox. And now uh tiktok as well and let me know your top five nicholas cage films we'd love to dive into some of the fan ones as well i think that will be a lot of fun so yeah back to the back to the kind of press junket i kind of wanted to dive into that a little bit because it was a really weird experience for me it's kind of fun exciting and it's it's kind of sent me on a loop because obviously i've done i've done interviews with kind of uh, massive talents on this podcast already and uh, yeah I, I i i get nervous i kind of i don't know but i've kind of got got used to that because you get to chat to the people beforehand but kind of doing it under this i don't know high pressure situation i guess uh, for someone like me of just like kind of you're dropped into a zoom room and it's like you've got your 20 minutes go and then the chat box they're kind of saying to you like you've got x amount of time left you've got x amount of time left and I know it's totally on me. It's nothing to do with kind of how junk it works, uh, how junk it's work in general. But I think it's that idea that I don't know. Uh, this podcast has been quite free flowing and stuff like that, and uh, it was a, it was a real like learning curve and a lot of fun. I guess you can you can hear and you can now see as well. You can head on over to YouTube and watch the video of this conversation uh which you can tell i didn't know i was going to be sent a video because you could see me like drinking bottles of water kind of i don't know, gestating way too much like gesturing like a madman uh kind of i don't know excitement levels just really high pumped up but uh yeah it was it was a lot of fun and i very much hope to get to do it again and yeah if you're if you're on the fence about seeing the unbearable weight of massive talent you're in for a treat this is a real kind of joy it's it's not just like there for the hardcore nick heads it's it's there for it's there for everyone it's a great kind of buddy cop uh, not buddy cop just but like bromance movie it kind of reminded me somewhat of the, uh, the jump street movies in that kind of tone that irreverence that kind of uh, wit and charm that those movies have and i think you'll uh, fall in love with tom and kevin's like version of nick and uh, pedro pascal's betrayal as harvey he very much is a, a conduit like a surrogate for all of us massive nick cage fans out there so yeah you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna love it like if you can like people always argue like ah, there's there's no there's no original content out there this is one of those films so Run out to a cinema and watch it now. And if you enjoy it, watch it again. Like let's let's. It would it would be great to see more films like this. It'd be great to see a sequel. I know that uh, in this chat, Tom and Kevin, obviously, we we joke about a potential sequel for this film. I would love to see that happen, and and, and I'm sure you would. So yeah, let's let's support the unbearable weight of massive talent because it's it's a whole lot of fun. A uh, massive thank you as well on this one to a few people. So Sam Clements, who kind of really fighted my corner with this one, gave me some like PR contacts and stuff like that, said, hey, chat to this person, chat to that person. Uh, Sab Astley as well. Again, somebody who kind of like, I put out something on Twitter and was like, email this person. They will, they will kind of uh, ha like, that. they will be, yeah they, they, they will they they will get involved they you're like they're the people to speak to whatever and another person as well daryl edge from the cage rage podcast who was kind of like my, my 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 partner in all of this in, in in a weird way we kind of went to the screening together we kind of talked before and after his junket he had an earlier slot than me and we really tried to make sure there was not a lot of crossover so between the two of us you've probably got a good decent slice about 40 minutes of massive talent chat so be sure to head on over to his page as well there'll be a little uh, link in the show notes where you can listen to that as well and hopefully you get like a kind of wider swath of of chat with tom and kevin that kind of yeah covers different ground and we kind of 
uh, get to get to all of it. We get to kind of ask all the questions we would have done if we had both had more time, and we've just done it over two separate slots. So yeah, a massive thank you to everyone at Lionsgate and all the kind of PR people I've I've dealt with over this whole thing as well because it's been it's been an absolute trip, and I I, I look forward to kind of doing it again, and may, maybe next time. Maybe next time we'll get to speak to the big man himself. I know that it was something that I very much pushed for. I kind of said, hey, if there's ever a time that Nick Cage were to appear on a Nick Cage podcast, surely it's for a film where Nick Cage is playing Nick Cage. So, yeah, unfortunately it didn't happen. But as we say, we ride on to the next film and we we, we try again. We hunkered down. Um, so if you enjoyed this chat, this is your first time here on the podcast please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this right now. Give us a lovely, yeah, give us a lovely five-star review and um, let me know. Let me know what's your favourite Nick Cage film in your review as well. I always love to know what people, what people like, what, yeah, what's their, what's their favourite. Uh, I just, just, I don't know. I, I love this community of kind of Nick heads we got out there. So, yeah, a massive, a massive love to you all. And um, as always, I've been Petrus Pat Syllabus. I've been caged in. I'll catch you next time. Oh,